What's up, everyone? It's your host, Chris Rosvoglu, and welcome to another edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast presented by Boo Crew Media and Level Water. Level Water is a New Orleans-based bottled water company providing a sustainable, reliable brand of water that relates to this generation and its ever-growing health-conscious lifestyles. Make sure to go check them out at levelwaterco.com or on Instagram at Level Water Co. Great stuff there. And the NFL draft is literally around the corner. When I mean around the corner, it's two days away from when I'm recording, one day away from when you're listening to this show on this beautiful Wednesday. And it's going to be a fun one. And I think this one, more than ever, there's a lot of uncertainty with who's going to get taken and you know what these all these trades that might happen and the quarterback market's heating up. And there's a lot of storylines to follow. And with the Saints specifically, there's a lot, especially after the latest report that came out involving Virginia Tech cornerback Caleb Farley, which I'm going to discuss in just a second. But before I do that, just want to throw it out there that Boo Crew Media has a really cool giveaway going out. The winner is going to be announced on Thursday, so you still have time to enter while you're listening to this. Just go to either Boo Crew Media on Instagram or Straight Up Saints, either one. You'll see that there's a post there. You're going to like that post. You're going to follow the two accounts and you're going to tag a friend who you would bring with you to a Saints game. Now, why do I say tag a friend you would bring to uh, bring with you to a Saints game? Well, that's because the winner of this giveaway will get two tickets to the Saints home opener, an official Saints draft hat and a Buku Media shirt. So really fun giveaway there. So shout out to Buku Media and Level Water for putting that together. Really great stuff for you Saints fans. Again, winner announced on Thursday, right before the draft around 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern. And we'll go from there. Obviously, a lot of people entered so far. So make sure you get in there and get a chance at this fun giveaway. Now, with that said, let's get into some talk about the Saints and what they might do. And I think the most interesting thing we saw this week so far is the news that the Saints, according to Charles Robinson from Yahoo Sports, have interest in moving up for Virginia Tech cornerback Caleb Farley. Now, you want to be careful with what you hear and whether or not it's true and whether or not this is a smoke screen. Because again, when the draft is so close, people might just throw stuff at the wall and be like, Hey, we'll see what sticks. We'll see who buys what. And you kind of want to dictate the board, especially when you're the saints and you're picking 28, you're going to need a lot of things to fall your way. If you want your guy to fall to that spot. So we're going to talk about Caleb Farley, whether he's worth moving up. What if the saints miss out on a corner? I definitely want to talk about that because you have to always plan for the worst. Hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Talk about other positions of need for the Saints, what I think they will come out with. And that really is obviously more prediction-based than anything. There's really no scientific fact there that I know who they're going to come out with. That is really just me giving my best educated guess for you guys. And also talk about some other prospects that I necessarily didn't talk about enough yet. And we'll see whether or not they fit in with what the Saints are trying to do. So let's go back to Caleb Farley. Saints reportedly like him, willing to move up for him. That is the report from Charles Robinson. They would need to get in front of the Tennessee Titans, according to this report. Now, the Titans, they have needs at cornerback, for sure, especially after the way that this offseason went for them, getting rid of a Dory Jackson and getting rid of Malcolm Butler. It's safe to say that they have a major need at cornerback. Now, Caleb Farley is the weird case where it's high risk, high reward. And if you think that the reward is worth going through the risk, then yes, he is your guy. Because I've told people, and I've tweeted it about 13 times over the last couple of weeks, Caleb Farley, for my money, is the top cornerback in this class. When you just watch him on film and you see what he can do, I think you're looking at a tall, physical press corner who has a lot of room to grow because a lot of people kind of miss the fact that this position's new for Caleb Farley. He's about two, three years into this position, which means we don't even know what this guy's ceilings yet. Could it be a top five corner in this league? Well, if he stays healthy, sure. Now the downside, what if he's injured? What if he doesn't see the field? Well, you're wasting a first round pick on a guy who, is he going to play 16 games or should I say 17 games now under the new CBA? So there's a lot to unpack with Caleb Farley. And what makes it so challenging is of course, and I knew something was going to come out because this always comes out before the draft. And mind you teams know of this before, you know, obviously because us people are not going to know before a team does all the medical work, but Ian Rappaport and Tom Pelissero put out a long piece on Caleb Farley. What's going on with his situation. And they went through his medical history. And while going through his medical history, there was something there that was really concerning. So everyone knew that Farley's had two back surgeries done so far. Obviously, that's a really high number. And it's even worse when you consider the fact that it happened after he played at Virginia Tech. Now, one of the injuries occurred during his Virginia Tech career. The second surgery, though, was because there was a problem there that was still lingering. And that's why he wasn't even in season mode. So, again, a little concern. Here's the quote that really, really just sticks with me. Fairly says he irritated the S1 joint a couple of months ago, leading to the second microdisectomy last month. 
Farley still has some weakness in one of his big toes, suggesting a nerve hasn't fully recovered since the latest procedure. But that's normal at this stage of recovery, which is ongoing. Now, it's good to know that that's normal, all right? Because if it wasn't, we have a real problem here. However, you need to take that into consideration that your first round pick might not be ready for the start of the season. Now, I know it's just April and the start of the season is until September, but I've seen, I've seen crazier things happen. It's not totally out of whack to say you can draft Farley and he's not ready for September. It's totally in the realm of possibility. Now, where is he going to go? Well, Pelissero and Rappaport have conflicting reports. They said some GMs say Farley is still going first round. And some say he might fall to the second round. Now, if he falls to the second round, I think he's a no-brainer for whoever takes him because I do think the value there is just too good to pass up. And if there's even a 20% chance, and that's low, but a 20% chance he hits his full ceiling, he's worth a second-round pick. And it kind of reminds me of Jalen Smith, who, if you look back at it, there's probably a lot of teams that would have taken Jalen Smith had they you know, seen what happened four years, five years later. They'd be like, okay, yeah, I would have taken Jalen Smith had we had a redo. So... I'm not trying to compare the two situations. I'm saying if he does go to day two, you can justify taking Caleb Farley a little bit more. So what changes if the Saints move up to take Caleb Farley? What changes? I think a lot changes. I think the optics of this move and how people perceive it changes the most. And what do I mean by that? When you see the Saints, and let's say they take Caleb Farley at 28, while you'll still have buyer beware, and you will be a little concerned, and you're going to be cautiously optimistic, but you will be concerned about his back injury. What can you tell yourself? Well, you're sitting at 28. Your biggest need was cornerback. And the most talented prospect at said position fell to 28. So you almost feel justified in taking him. Now, how do the optics change? Have you trade up? You trade up to 20 and you mortgage a day two pick and you go up to 20 and you take Caleb Farley. You better hope that he's ready to go because if he's not, guess what? Not only did you waste a first round pick, you also moved up to get him. So there's more at stake. And while you might not think it's major, it does change things. When you move up, it changes how everyone views everything. If the Saints hadn't moved up for Marcus Davenport the way they did, people wouldn't be on his back as much as they are. Now, when you mortgage an extra first-round pick and Marcus Davenport shows zero improvement from 2019 to 2020, people are going to be on your back. And instead of calling you a bust, they'll call you a bust instead of two firsts. But now he's two firsts and he's a bust, so it's even worse. It matters. Things matter. Situations matter. It goes to every situation. Had the Niners, let's say, hypothetically drafted Mac Jones at 12, no one's going to say anything. If they draft him at three, people are going to complain. Scenarios matter. And for the Saints, if you trade up to get Caleb Farley, you better hope you don't miss. You better hope you don't miss, especially if you move up to pick 18, pick 20, around that ballpark. You better hope you get this right. If you sit there at 28 and he falls, I think you have some leeway because he will probably be by far the best player available in this year's draft. Now, here's the last thing I'll say about Farley about before I move over to the next topic, because there's other people I want to talk about besides the Virginia Tech cornerback. This is where I stand on this topic. The Saints draft Caleb Farley. I will be very pleased with the pick because I think he is one of the 10 best players in this draft. And I think for the Saints, knowing the offseason they've had, for them to add a top 10 talent in this year's draft, I think that'd be really, really, really beneficial to this ball club. Now, will I be nervous? Will I expect cryptic comments during training camp? Yes. And as long as you're willing to accept that, then you can get on board with Caleb Farley. That's how good he is. And I'm not here to sell you guys on Caleb Farley. I want you guys to make your own opinions on Caleb Farley and whether or not you think he's worth it, whether it's at 28, whether it's at 21, whether it's at any pick. But I'm just letting you guys know how I feel about this particular player. I think he is that good. And unfortunately, there's going to be risk. But there's risk with a lot of players. I know people brought up Lattimore with me. You brought up Ramchek. Now, I want to caution you. Those are different circumstances. But it just goes to show you kind of never know with the right doctors. You you might figure out the situation for Caleb. It is scary. But I understand why teams like the Saints are interested. He's so talented. I do think he's cornerback one in this draft. Now, let's move over to another scenario. What happens if the Saints are in a doomsday position? And I know you guys are like, oh, well, here comes Chris with the negativity. And I I think it's something we should consider because you, like I said, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. And when you prepare for the worst, you're going to be in a good spot, I think. So let's go through this hypothetical scenario. No linebacker you may want on the Saints is available. Jeremiah Wusu koromoa from Notre Dame is gone. Zayvon Collins from Tulsa is gone. And how about the cornerback class? Well, we look at the board and Caleb Farley's gone. And Greg Newsome, who you guys know I really like, he's gone. Patrick Sertain and J.C. Horn are the no-brainers, definitely gone, probably gone through the first 15 picks. 
So all the cornerbacks you want are gone. All the linebackers you may consider no longer available. What does that lead the Saints to do? Do you reach on a defensive player because you need defensive help? No. And if for anyone who says yes, then I really kind of don't understand. I think you the one thing you want to do is add talent. And I think the Saints have more needs than people think. And when you sit there, if you trust your board, you're still going to get a high quality player, even if it's at 28. So let's go through the scenario. The corners are gone. The linebackers are gone. What can the Saints do to better their team? I think there's multiple guys on the board. The Saints can probably still add to become a better football team. And let's start off with the wide receiver position. Rashad Bateman, Kadarius Toney, Elijah Moore, uh, Terrace Marshall, four receivers I named to you. At least two of them are going to be available, in my, in my opinion, at 28. I think Elijah Moore would probably be one of them. And if I had a bet, I'd probably say Terrace Marshall would be the other. Now, two different receivers. Moore is really the speed guy, 5'10", not going to be that red zone target where Marshall will be. But, you know, it obviously brings that dynamic uh, element to the offense that you could use. Marshall, though, gives you a red zone target, and you couldn't use that. No Jared Cook, you lose Emmanuel Sanders. You need more red zone threats. So I think either one would be an intriguing fit. And that's why I think if if all else fails and you can't get a corner, you can't get a linebacker, it wouldn't hurt to go after receiver. This is a really good receiver class. And if there's one position you're going to fall in love with for this year's draft, it is the wide out position. So I think adding one of those guys would really benefit the offense. And I think it would really benefit Jameis Winston. And if you're all in on revitalizing Jameis's career, you might as well give him the weapons. And heck, if you're not all in on Jameis Winston revitalizing his career in New Orleans, whoever the starter is needs another weapon. We can't go through the same thing year in, year out, where we'll get an undrafted guy or the weapons we have are fine. Sure, but you know at least one of them is going to get injured. And you know one of them is probably not going to live up to their potential. So what does that leave you with? What you hope is Michael Thomas fully healthy, which if so, you know what you get from Michael Thomas. However, what are you getting across from him? What is Trey Quan Smith going to be? What is Marquez Callaway going to be in year two? Can Deontay Harris be healthy for a full season if he does returning and receiving? I say no. Some of you might say yes. But these are all questions that we have to be real with each other. And if we're not real with each other, then we're being delusional about what this team has at receiver. And one thing I've noticed, the best teams in the league always add weapons. For the exclu- you know the exception of the, the Packers, they do not add weapons. But every other good team... What do they do? They load their young quarterbacks with receiver after receiver after receiver because it's worth it. The Chiefs have a stacked offense. What do they do? They go out, they get McCole Hardman, and people are like, hey, well, they didn't need him, but hey, it's another speed threat. Then they win a Super Bowl. What do they do? They get Clyde Edwards-Alaire, and I guarantee you, if the Chiefs have a shot and the board works out in their way, they'll add another player, whether it's a running back or a tight end or receiver, they'll get another weapon because you help out your young guys. And if you don't do that, then you're putting yourself in a bad spot. So at some point, the Saints need to get a receiver. And if the cornerback or the linebackers are not there, go for receiver at 28. There's going to be really good value there. So I wouldn't mind that at all. So on the flip side, I talked about not reaching. What does reaching look like? If the top four cornerbacks are off the board, I don't think there's another corner that should go in the first round. Will there? Probably. Teams reach all the time. Should there? I don't think so. And I like Asante Samuel Jr., I'm lukewarm on Kelvin Joseph. I do like Melifon Wu from Syracuse, but I don't think any of those guys that I mentioned are day one. If I had to pick one, I think it's Asante Samuel Jr. And I think that's because he is just a playmaker pound for pound. Now, 5'10 frame, that does scare people off, but I just think he's the best corner out of the three that I mentioned. Still don't think he's day one. And when you're a smaller corner, very rarely, you, you have to be so exceptional with your ball skills, so exceptional with your craft and your technique to thrive at that size because we don't see it too often. So if I'm the Saints and corner's not there, figure it out day two. Figure it out day two. Find who you like, whether it's the second or third round on day two, target that guy and make sure you get him, whether you have to move up or whether he comes to you. It doesn't matter to me. Just figure it out. So I think receiver's something that people should consider. Now, I went through the doomsday scenario. Now, let's flip it to the other side. Let's go a little positive here. Talk about ideal scenario. And if you guys say, hey, Chris, what is your ideal scenario for this draft? I'll lay it out to you, and I don't think it's going to happen, but it would be my ideal scenario that is somewhat realistic. And by somewhat realistic, I mean it wouldn't surprise me if this happens. You know, And I'm not talking about quarterback because I think that would not be realistic. So the Saints are sitting at 28, and we're around pick 21. Indianapolis on the clock. 
And Jeremiah Wusu Kormo is there. And you guys know that I love JOK and I will continue to ring the bell for JOK because I think he's that good of a player. And Nick Underhill last week kind of just expressed that same sentiment where JOK does things that a lot of prospects just can't do. He could run sideline to sideline. He can thump in the run game. He could get back and cover. He's what you want in today's hybrid linebacker safety NFL. That's what you want a guy like JOK. So Saints move up to 21. They get JOK. Okay. Indianapolis doesn't have a need for linebacker for crying out loud. Darius Leonard could do it all by himself if he wanted to. And luckily for him, he doesn't have to do it all by himself because they have a pretty damn good defense in Indianapolis, especially in that front seven. So the Saints move up. They get JOK. Okay, and that leaves everyone saying, well, you get JOK okay and you fill that linebacker void. But what else are you going to do for cornerback? Well, you can go address it in day two. Now, you will have one less day two pick because one of those day two picks will be used to move up and get JOK. Okay. But I say you get another corner, maybe a Melo Fonwu. Maybe a True Williams, maybe a Kelvin Joseph, and you get Richard Sherman in the building for a year, maybe two, but I would say a year because you really don't want to risk it. And Sherman starts, and you're hoping that the other guys are just a sponge and he just takes in whatever Sherman says on and off the field. And maybe you got something. Maybe. That would be for me my best case scenario because as much as I love Farley, as much as I love Newsom, and I love both those prospects. I think JOK is special, and I think the right team, and I don't even know if the Saints are the right team, but if the right team uses JOK the way he's meant to be used, it's going to be a force in this league for a long time. So that would be my best case scenario. And I'll give you one more scenario, and I call this the wacky scenario. And why I mean it's wacky is just because no one probably really is talking about it enough. However, it wouldn't be a bad scenario. So let's say the Saints are sitting at 28, and they don't like the receivers on the board, and they don't like the linebackers on the board, and they don't like the corners there. What do they do? Well, what if an edge rusher like Jalen Phillips is sitting there? And I know some of you probably just rolled your eyes when I said that name. And why? Because, man, if we go through Jalen Phillips' history, it is really complicated. In terms of film, this kid is a stud. And I think pound for pound, he's the best edge rusher in this class. When you just watch him, he is just polished. He knows what he's doing. You've seen him play well for two different schools. I think that matters. And I think with Jalen, you just play him year one, and you know he's going to get after the quarterback. However. You cannot mention Jalen Phillips without talking about his injury history. And he had to retire early at UCLA because of concussions. And then he goes to Miami, plays extremely well. But you have that just doubt or that concern that is he one more concussion away from saying football isn't worth it for me? And I'm not knocking him for him, for him if he ever thought that. I'm saying as a team, though, that needs to be in the back of your mind because if you're going to invest a day one pick, you're hoping that guy's there for at least the five years of his rookie contract. If he's not, then it's tough to justify. So I think Jalen Phillips, again, really intriguing guy. This is just a wacky scenario there. I would not hate the pick at all. I actually would love it a lot. I didn't talk about Jalen Phillips enough, and that's on me, but I think he is an exceptional talent. Obviously a complicated history, but I really do like Jalen Phillips a hell of a lot. Now, let's get into something I want to talk about. It's a kind of a broad subject, but I want to discuss that before I get into my predictions and wrap up this episode of Straight Up Saints. And that's the idea of trading up. Is trading up worth it? That is something that a lot of people love to discuss. And some people hate it. And some people like it. And I like it. And I I like it a hell of a lot. And the reason I like it a lot is because I think when you're a team, if you like a certain prospect, I don't think you should give a shit what anyone else has to think except for you about that prospect. And what I mean by that is if the Saints do like Caleb Farley, or if the Saints do like Greg Newsom, or if they like uh, JOK, or they do like Zayvon Collins, and they don't think they're going to be there at 28, and they got to move up three, four spots, and it costs them a fourth, costs them a third, but they got to do it, do it. And I know some fans might be upset with that because some fans just like the quantity over the quality. You go look back at other drafts, and you tell me how many of those picks actually make the 53-man roster. Not a lot, not a lot. And if I go through the last three drafts, guys, you're looking at them and you realize what I mean. So let's go 2020 Saints went for quality over quantity. Now, the funny thing is the quality hasn't been paying it off, but the Saints got Ruiz. Then they traded up for Zach Bond. They traded up for Adam Troutman. And then they traded back into the seventh round to get Tommy Stevens. Now, Tommy Stevens is already off the roster. He's on the Panthers. Zach Bond is not playing much. Adam Troutman, I think, is the one guy who we all pretty much like. And he's still unproven, but I think you saw enough to say, okay, this kid's got potential. And then Cesar Ruiz, who is going to start next year, it's just, is he going to be good? That's the question, and that's a really big question to ask. But anyway, there's two guys that are playing, 
One is a maybe, and one's off the roster. Let's kick it to 2019. Eric McCoy, hell of a pick in the second round. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, hell of a pick in the fourth round. After that, Saquon Hampton, Elise Mack, Caden Ellis. Now I know Caden Ellis is on the roster. We haven't gotten anything from them. And, and two, Hampton and Mack are goners at this point. Just You're not going to see them. Mack literally didn't even make the roster in 2019. 2018, I think, is the one that you hit home every single time. Marcus Davenport, first round, whatever. Not getting into that, guys. Not today. Today's not the day to talk about Davenport. Round three, Traquan Smith. I'm going to call that a hit. I don't care what anyone says. You could call Traquan a bust. If you get a third rounder that's still on the team making some plays, and Traquan makes more than some plays, I'll take it. But here's where it gets dicey. Rick Leonard, Natrell Jamerson, Cameron Moore, Boston Scott, Will Clapp. Will Clapp's the only one out of those names I mentioned that's still on the roster. So that's four guys between Boston Scott, Cameron Moore, Natrell Jamerson, Rick Leonard. Do those guys matter to the Saints? They're not even on the Saints roster. And why am I saying that? What I'm saying is you can risk giving up maybe a Natrell Jamerson or a Rick Leonard if it means you can move up and get a guy that you know that you really like, that you can have week one, that you can have a starter in your system the minute he comes to training camp and shows up. So I think that's important because not every draft is 2017. Heck, not every one, not every, you know, you get 10 drafts, you are lucky if you get that 2017 class. I would go as far as say you get 20 shots at it. You're not getting that 2017 class. So I think if you're the Saints, you got a mortgage, a pick or two, do it. And remember, you got comp picks next year. You got comp picks from Atlanta. You probably should get that comp pick from losing um, Trey Hendrickson. You might get another comp pick per, for losing Sheldon Rankins. There are opportunities there for the Saints to just stack up against some picks. And because they know that, they could mortgage some of next year's picks or they could mortgage some of this year's picks. But it gives them the flexibility that the Saints haven't had in a long time. And where the Saints lost financial flexibility because of cap space, they will gain flexibility in terms of draft assets, draft capital, and just being able to move around and deal uh, and, and just be at least a player in the sweepstakes for day one, day two, day three of this draft. But I think it's really important, guys, because I know a lot of people tell me, well, I'd rather have Farley at 28 than Farley at 21. Okay, sure. And I get it, Farley's questionable, but what if Farley ain't making it at 28 and you got to sit there at 28 and hope he gets there? But what if he's your dude? Go up and get him. I do not like this idea that you have to wait and hope that another team doesn't take your guy screw all that guys just screw all that because you know what happens when you do that someone else gets Patrick Mahomes now I know not everyone's a Patrick Mahomes what I mean by that is if someone is your guy go get him I don't care what the position is go get him I do not care go get that prospect and you know what Caleb's got a lot of injury concerns the Saints really think that this guy's the best corner and they really feel comfortable with his medicals go get him I'll live with the consequences. Go get him, though. And at least I see something from Caleb Farley. I never saw anything from Davenport that warranted them doing that. And even then, I had blind faith in the team, but I never saw it. Farley, I see it. And I'm not just trying to lynch onto one guy and say, oh, that, you know, let me just, you know, cling on to him and uh, this is my dude. But Farley is talented. And so is Newsom. And so is JOK. And if any of these dudes are the Saints, premier guy, go up. Because at the end of the day, in a year from now, three months from now, that third round pick that you were afraid to mortgage could just be Rick Leonard. And who the hell needs a Rick Leonard? No one. And I know Rick Leonard's probably sitting somewhere like, why the hell am I getting picked on? But I'm just trying to give you guys context for things like these. Now, before I wrap it up, guys, I want to give you my predictions for what I think will go down the first two days. And hell, I, this is no information that I know that people don't. It's just me making predictions off what I'm reading and what I just think makes sense. And day one, I'm going to stick with my, basically with my gut. My gut's been telling me they're going cornerback. And my gut's been telling me the Saints are going to move up to get either Caleb Farley and Greg Newsom. And I know you guys are going to think that's boring, that I just basically made a prediction of something I've been saying for the last couple of weeks. But why would I change it now? The Saints know they need a corner. Sean Payton said it's a must to fulfill that position to need. And not only is it a must, I think if the Saints move up to 28, 21, and, and I keep saying 21 because I think Indianapolis is very, very complete. And I think Indy, if Indy wants to move back to 28, get some assets, grab another receiver for Carson Wentz, I do not think that would be the worst case in the world. Or maybe Jenkins from Oklahoma State, get another offensive lineman. They got options there. So I think Indianapolis is a nice little spot to go jump up there if they wanted to. And Farley or Newsom might just be BPA at 21. BPA and 
position of need. Heck, I think Farley, if you like his medicals, BPA, as soon as you hit pick 15. That's how good I think he is. So I, I'm going to go Farley or Newsom. Day one, I think the Saints grab a corner and fill that out. Now, day two, what do you need to do? I know you guys want Jabril Cox. I probably want Jabril Cox too, man. I think he can cover, and I think he'd be really good next to Demario Davis. But for some reason, call it the LSU thing. Call it the fact that I don't know if the Saints are going to trade up two days in a row. I think the Saints are going to get a receiver on day two, and I think Dwayne Eskridge from Western Michigan is a guy that people should keep an eye on. And I think the thing about Dwayne that I really, really like is the fact that he has really good speed. You can hit him on a screen pass, and he could take that for 50 yards. And he, he is not exactly going to be that physical guy, and he doesn't really fit the Saints' mold at 5'9", but I actually think Dwayne Eskridge, and I'm not trying to compare the two players, but him and Elijah Moore are those dudes where – hit him for five and they could take it for 50. And I think the difference is one might go round one, one might go round two or round three. And there's good value in Eskridge. The Saints are reportedly interested. I think he would be a tremendous fit. Now he's not the only thing that the only player that I think the Saints are going to add day two, they are going to have at least for now, two third round picks. I think the Saints would be very wise to go get themselves a defensive lineman, whether that's a defensive tackle um, from USC. There's a, uh, there's a couple guys there. They got Jay, they got Marlon and they both visited with the Saints. You have Aleem McNeil, who you guys know I really like his athleticism. There's a bunch of options there. Davion Nixon from Iowa, another guy that I've talked about. Even Milton Williams from uh, Louisiana Tech is another name that I think people should throw out there. So we'll see what happens. I think the Saints are going to get a D lineman and a wide receiver on day two. I think they're going to get a cornerback on day one, and you'll figure out what happens day, two, day three. Day three, I, I will obviously be watching it for work purposes, but day three is where – I think you're just, you're guessing. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I think day three after round four, you are, you are all in this guessing round five, six, and seven. You are hoping that this guy's potential hits or this man fixes this issue or, you know what I mean? It's just not that easy to figure out and project what a guy round five, six, and seven is going to be, but round one through three specifically cornerback receiver, defensive lineman. That's what I think the Saints are going to target. And like I said, Farley or Newsom day one, Amir Smith, Marset, or Dwayne Eskridge on day two, and and also add maybe an Ali McNeil or Jay Tufele or maybe Davion Nixon, a defensive lineman that you could throw in there and figure it out uh, to put next to David on your mind. I think that'd be a really really big plus for the Saints. So before I wrap it up, a couple of things I just want to throw out there, guys. Just be really 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 patient if you can. I mean, this is going to be a weird draft. I think Thursday is going to take forever between the trades and. What might happen? I think this could be a long draft. I can see this thing not finishing till like 12 30, 1 a.m., whatever the hell it might be. So have patience in that regard. Obviously, have fun. I think it's going to be a nice spectacle there. But just remember the Saints got to trust their board. You know, when you reach for position of need, that's how you end up with a guy that you really, really shouldn't have taken. And it happens a lot. And, and the Saints are one of the teams that usually avoids it, but not everyone is immune to that. You know, a lot of teams do fall for that and they say, hey, we really need a corner. Let's go do it. Let's go take this guy. And then you miss out on a guy who is really talented and maybe he wasn't at the position that you really needed, but heck, you'd love to have him on your football team and, sh- and fortify that unit. So I think the Saints need to trust their board. I think they will trust their board. And even if the doomsday scenario, which I talked about before, does happen, there's a lot of talent here that the Saints can add. And I'm really, really interested to see what they do specifically on Thursday night because that's when you talk about the, the fireworks. Friday was it's going to be really fun too because the Saints do have multiple picks but I do want to see what happens Thursday. I think it's going to be really fun to see how that all goes down. So that's going to be the last episode for now for Straight Up Saints regarding draft coverage. However, I will have an episode up later this week. I'm trying to figure out what day, but I definitely want to analyze at the minimum the day one pick, but I would love to do day one and day two little recap for you guys and talk about that. But until then, guys, buckle up. Get ready for what should be a very, very interesting NFL draft. And while you have it, have some, you know, Have your favorite drink, have your favorite water on the side too. I don't know, whatever you guys need to stay hydrated and have some fun during this NFL draft. So it should be an interesting one. Stay tuned for more content in the near future on the Straight Up Saints podcast.